hopefully you're excited to get back to uni, to get back into your sport, to play again. I know you get to play a little bit while you're here, but it kind of whets your appetite, doesn't it, after Christmas for, for more sport. Uh, I've got a football game this week, which I'm looking forward to. But what I'm most looking forward to in the next week or so is, is Nets start for cricket. Uh, I've joined a, a, a new cricket team, our cricket team folded. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to getting ready for the season ahead. Now, uh, always kind of pre-season, you have these imaginings, don't you, of just how well the season is going to go. Depending whether you're a cup half empty or a cup half full person. My cup slightly overflows. So <laughs> I have great expectations on the season ahead. And just imagine the first net session in a week or so. And we're there and, you know, bowling well and batting well. And one of the guys decides to post it on YouTube. Just imagine that happens. Imagine that Chris Silverwood, the, the England coach, happens to watch that on YouTube. You can see where my head goes most of the time. And uh, he knows that today England are having a pretty bad time uh, in the test down in Cape Town. And instead of playing for Hinton in the Hedges, which is the name of our team, uh, in their, uh, their white with green uh, kind of trim uh, tops, that I actually said, Do you know what, Greg? Because my number's obviously on the YouTube clip. Uh, why don't you fly out to Port Elizabeth to play in the third test for England? Joe Root, he's not having a great time. Why don't you step in, captain the team? Now, slightly far-fetched, slightly far-fetched, that dream, that, that vision. But imagine it happened. And imagine Port Elizabeth came round. I'm sure because of being here and, and seeing me and getting to know me a bit, some of you might actually might watch the test. Go, oh, I can't believe this guy's actually going to play for England in the third test. And imagine the start of the game came and England were fielding and they ran out of the pitch and I ran out there with them, but instead of wearing the England kit with the three lions on, I ran out in the Hinton in the Hedges kit. It'd be a little bit embarrassing, wouldn't it? You'd be like, oh, seriously, Greg? What are you doing? Why have you done that? That's foolishness. You're, you're playing for a different team now. You're playing for England in a test match against South Africa. You're not playing in Hinton in the Hedges in South North Hants, Division 1. It'd be ridiculous, wouldn't it? to run out in hint and kit. Now, here's the thing. As Christians, so often we wear the wrong kit. So often. We're playing for a new team, and so often we wear the old kit. Look at the journey we've been on over the last few days. Duncan, on the first day, reminded us what it meant to live for Christ in the world of sport, to live amongst outsiders, to pray, play, say, together. And then we looked at how do we... How do we even be motivated to live like that in the world of sport? And we went right back to Colossians chapter 1, didn't we? And we looked at Jesus deeply and clearly. We saw that he is the creator, the sustainer, the purpose of everything. He is the supreme one, and he has done everything for us to be at peace with God. And then last night, we looked at being rooted and established in him. In him. Not distracted by other philosophies and deceptions of the world, but to be established in Jesus. And third chapter, today, we are looking at what it means to wear the kit of Christ, to live as his people in the world of sport. What does that really look, right, look, like, look like? Get into the nitty-gritty of it. So let's get into it. Look down at verse 1. Verse 1 to 4 gives us this, this picture, this, this vision, this remembrance, so that when we look at the nitty-gritty, we're crystal clear on who we are. We're crystal clear on who we are. So the first point really is, remember who you are. It sounds a, a silly thing, isn't it? It's not often you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and go, who am I? What's my name again? But so often as Christians, we forget who we are in him. We all know about muscle memory in sport, where you just keep practicing, keep practicing the same shots time and time again until it's just instinctive. The ball comes down, boom, you hit the shot. Muscle memory. And the thing is, for us, we're so used to living in the world, we're so used to living in sin that we have a muscle memory towards it. And our bodies decay and our brains decay and we forget who we are quickly and often. But here he says, since then, you have been raised with Christ Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Look at what he tells us in these verses about who we are in Christ. He tells us about the past. You have died and been raised. Do you see that? You've died and been raised with Christ. You have a new life in him. That is who you are. The old self is gone. You have a new life. You are raised with Jesus. You are a child of God, an heir with him. That is you. That is your identity. Wake up tomorrow morning and say that to yourself in the mirror. New creation, raised with Christ, child of God. A great way to start the day. Remember who you are. But he also takes us to the present, doesn't he? Look, glory and the truth of new life is that it's hidden most of the time. Did you, did you pick that up? Verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Hidden with Christ in God. That is who you are. You walk out on the streets, you may go to Kidderminster train station today, go on a train, go to Birmingham and head off somewhere else. And to the general punter, they don't know that your identity is in Christ. They can't see it physically, can they? You don't wear particularly odd Christian clothing, unless you go in stash, uh, and then they will know. But it's not obvious for the world to see, but your life is hidden in Christ. But they will know. On the day that Jesus returns, the whole world will know whose are his. So though our lives are hidden with him now, it will be obvious to the world. And today we are to remember that we are his. It's so easy to forget, isn't it? So you can walk out of a a talk like this, of a conference like this, and be utterly foul in about an hour's time. Completely forget who you are. Completely forget who you are. Past, present, but also look at the future. Look what he says here. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Isn't that exciting? You raise with Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ. And you will appear with Christ in glory. That is who you are. Sure, you're a student, you're a sports person, you're a child of somebody, you're maybe even a sibling, but your true identity is that you're raised with Christ, you're hidden with Christ, and you appear with Christ. That is who you are. And as you remember who you are, you start to play in your new identity. So the key, the key to the Christian life, the key to living for Christ now is to remember who you are. Sounds obvious, doesn't it? Sounds simple. Probably the biggest battle you'll face in the Christian life. Remembering who you are. Not just on a monthly basis or on a yearly basis, but on a moment by moment basis. Remember who you are. And then he says two things to help us do that. Verse 2 and 3. No, verse 1 and 2. Set your hearts on things above. And notice verse 2, repetition but different. Set your minds on things above. Set your heart, your passions, your focus, be passionate about things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I wonder what you're passionate about. If somebody was to say what you're passionate about, how would they know? I wonder whether it would be looking at your browser history or the time you spend on your mobile phone and what you're watching, or where you spend your energy. I wonder if people will be able to determine then what you're really passionate about. Here, Paul says to the Colossians and to us, set your hearts on things above. Set your passions on Jesus. Be passionate about him. Let his goals, his plans, his purposes shape yours. But not only your passions, your minds. Set your minds on things above. Engage your brain. Don't just hope that it happens. Engage your brain in the activity of setting your mind and heart on things above. Fill your mind with things of God. We fill our minds with so much, don't we? You know, things like Amazon Prime and Netflix, they are not massively helpful at times. Particularly the box sets, they're unbelievably addictive. I went to one over Christmas called Chuck. Have you ever seen Chuck? It's about this ridiculous story, really. There's this guy, he works in like this, this supermarket esque kind of shop, and he happens to open an email and download all the secrets of the government onto his brain. And he gets surrounded by this team of spies, and he goes on to be a superhero. It is, it is a bizarre series. Unbelievably addictive. Don't watch it. 
sucks life and time out of you. But it's amazing, isn't it? You just think, oh, I'll just sit down, I'll watch a, a, a half an hour episode, and then four episodes later, you're like, where is my life? Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Focus. So remember who you are. As you leave here today, remember who you are. You're raised with Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ. You will appear with Christ. Set your passions as his passions. And set your mind on things above. So that's our kind of first part. And because of that, because of who you are in Christ, take off your old clothes because they stink. That's what he says next. Take off your old clothes because they stink. Often when I come to uh, conferences like this uh, and you're playing sport, you kind of think, oh, I've got limited packing, I'm just going to take one set. I know there's a few morning fitnesses and a couple of sports sessions. I'll just turn them inside out if I need to uh, and I'll be fine. And you always find by that morning session on the last day, the morning fitness, that you really honk. Uh, and you know it, and those around you know it, and you try and find others that are honking too and just try and blend in, uh, blend in with them. That's my tactic anyway. That's what you do. But here he says, look, take off your old clothes because they stink. In fact, it's stronger than that. Look at the wording in verse 5. Put to death, therefore. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature. Put it to death. He's not mucking about here. He's not saying, hey, look, if it's culturally relevant for you, if you prefer to live this way, it's probably a good way to live. No, put to death. Take it seriously. Put to death. And then he gives us two lists of five of things to put to death. To take off clothing that isn't who we are. Remember, you play for England now, not hinting in the hedges. Take off the kit. Here's the first few. Sexuality, impurity, lust. Our culture is sex mad, isn't it? Sex sells everything. It's everywhere. Ratings are continually changing on movies. And younger and younger age groups are exposed to sex. It's hard to avoid it in programs. It's hard to avoid it on the internet. People, a huge proportion of people, are addicted to pornography. An enormous proportion of people are addicted to pornography. Yet here, he says, put it to death. Have nothing to do with it. It stinks. Sexual morality, impurity, lust. It's not who you are. Stop it. Don't do it. I once had a coffee with a with a really good friend. Uh, and he um, and I meet up quite regularly. We've known each other for a long time. We played rugby together. And uh, he's a Christian. Uh, and we were chatting to each other. And we were um, uh, catching up about life and how things are going. And he's one of those guys that likes to ask the, the really difficult questions. And he said, so where are you sinning this week? I thought, Great, we're in a coffee shop. So exactly what you want to answer, isn't it? But he doesn't ever let me get away with it. So I said, well, do you know what? The thing I'm repenting for the most this week is uh, I've got little children and uh, I get home from work and I'm tired and uh, I just want to put my feet up when I get home. So I'm getting home, I'm putting my feet up, I'm letting my wife, who's also tired, cook supper and do the washing up. And I know it's poor form, I know it's not particularly loving, I know it's not servant-hearted, I just can't stop it. I keep having to repent for it every day and say sorry to her. So I just can't do it. He said, well, that's a lie, isn't it? <laughs> no. I've just poured my heart out to you. It's not a lie. He said, you said you can't do it. He said, if I came home with you tonight, and I stood there with a gun to your head, you'd have no problem washing up. You'd have no problem cooking the meal. It's just you don't want to. That's your problem. Because you've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten who you are. Remember who you are. Put to death the things that stink. Be rigorous in your life. Root it out. Don't absorb the culture and compromise. These are not your kit. Look at the next couple. Evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Worshipping created things rather than the creator that made you. So easy, isn't it? You can start with great intentions. You forget who you are and boom, within an instant. You're worshipping created things rather than the creator. Other things occupy your minds rather than Christ. 
Second list of five that Paul dives into in this section as we continue down. Look, they're, they're much more relational, how we relate to others. Look at verse 8. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. That's a pretty comprehensive list, though, isn't it? Anger, rage on that pitch when that guy gives you the elbow in the back. Don't do it. Malice, slander. In the changing room where that person's had a, had a pop at you and you just want to whisper in somebody's ear something nasty about them. Don't do it. Filthy language. You know, when you just want to feel part of the gang and the F word's going all over the place and you just feel like you need to join in. Don't do it. Look at verse 9. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Seems like a hard bar, doesn't it? A high bar to achieve. How on earth do we live like this? It seems almost impossible. The key? Remember who you are. Your life is now hidden with Christ. Christ is in you, chapter 1, hope of glory. You are rooted and established in him. His power through his spirit flows through you. That is who you are. Don't give in to the muscle memory of sin. Don't let it conquer you. Put it to death. Take off the old clothes because they stink. What about the new self? What about this new kit? What is this new kit we're to put on? Look at verse 10. And I have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. This new kit looks like Jesus. It looks like Jesus. It's being reminded of who we are, understanding who we are, and learning to live and look like Jesus. And notice down in verse 12, as this list, this second list begins, is rooted again in our identity. Therefore, Paul can't help himself but remind us of our identity. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Did you notice that? You know, Paul always does this in his letters. He doesn't start off with your kind of chapter 3 of Colossians or your chapter 4 and 5 of Ephesians where he just goes, don't do this, do this. Always it starts with who Jesus is and who we are in him. Why? Because when we realise who we are in Christ... Our understanding affects our feelings, affects our behaviour. So the more I grasp that I am a child of God, that I am raised with him, I am hidden with him, and I will appear with him, my feelings towards my behaviour change, and I no longer, no longer want to do it. If I focus first on the behaviour, it's just a battle that I end up losing and feeling guilty about. Understanding affects our feelings, affects our behaviour. And Paul here just reminds us of that. Therefore... Again, who are you? God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Though you're rotten to the core at times, though often your clothing stinks because you forget who you are, because of Christ, you're dearly loved. Though so often we forget about him and live for ourselves rather than him, and we worship created things rather than the creator, we're his chosen people because of Christ. Isn't that awesome? And he sees everything not just what we present to others. And then he has got this wonderful list of things to clothe ourselves with, to set our minds on. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with each other, forgiving one another, forgiving as the Lord forgave you. These are qualities that the world actually delights in. They're not portrayed in culture or in the media. But nobody rejects a person like this. They love people like this. They love them. We have a, a, a couple in our church, a relatively elderly couple in our church, and it's always a joy to see them. They arrive at church, and they both insist on giving you a massive hug, which was when they're on the welcome team means it takes ages for people to come into church because there's this queue waiting for their hug uh, each week. And they're just so warm and gentle and kind and loving and consistent all the time. You can't help but want to see them and be around them. 
And notice what we're to put over all these virtues in verse 14. Love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I once had a great story that encapsulates what these characteristics look like of a, of a lady during apartheid, just after apartheid in South Africa. And uh, let me read it to you. This is a lady who knew what it meant to wear the clothing of the king. It says this, the article. In an emotionally charged courtroom, a South African woman stood with her silent tears, listening to white police officers acknowledge their atrocities. Officer Vanderbrook admitted that he had shot her 18-year-old son at point-blank range. Then he and others partied while they burned her son's body, turning it over and over until it was reduced to ashes. Eight years later, Vanderbrook and his associates returned to seize her husband. She was forced to watch while they poured gasoline over him and set him on fire. As the flames consumed him, her husband's last words were simply, forgive them. Now, Vanderbrook awaited judgment. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission asked the woman what she wanted. Calmly weeping, she said, I want three things. I want Mr. Vanderbrook to take me to the place where they buried my husband's body so I can gather up the dust and give him a proper burial. Second, Mr. Vanderbrook took all my family from me and I still have a lot of love to give. So twice a month, I would like him for him to come to the ghetto and spend a day with me so I can be a mother to him. Third, I would like Mr. Vanderbrook to know that he is forgiven by God and that I forgive him. I would like to embrace him so he will know my forgiveness is real. As the elderly woman walked slowly across the courtroom, Officer Vanderbrook stood up to receive her embrace and fainted. He was overwhelmed by the spiritual power of this African woman. In the back of the courtroom, someone began to sing Amazing Grace. That is a lady who has put on the new clothes of Christ, who has taken off her old kit, who has remembered who she is in Jesus and is living out the new clothes of Christ. A child of the king living for the king. So how do you do that this term? How do you do that this term? Well, verse 15 helps us. 16 and 17, three things, three practical ways to remember who you are, to set your minds on things above, to take off the old clothes and put on the new. Look at the first in verse 15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That means to remember the peace between you and God that has been caused by the cross of Christ. Remember the gospel. Gospel yourself. Don't think, oh, I've done the training at Christians in Sport and I know those six windows, it's done. Each day, remind yourself of the gospel. Remind yourself and let it rule in your hearts. Let it rule in the source of your passions, the peace between you and God. Whatever you've done, whoever you are, in Christ you are forgiven. Isn't that awesome? Let it rule. Let it rule in your hearts. Verse 16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. If your muscle memory causes you to forget, if your muscle memory causes you to put the old clothes back on, you've got to let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. That's why church is crucial, isn't it? Not an optional extra for a Christian. It's a family we need to be part of because we can't self-sustain. We can't keep ourselves going on our own. You often hear the analogy, don't you, of a, a hot fire. We'll have seen hot fires over Christmas. And, and, and a great analogy of what it's like to be a Christian in isolation is you see a glowing coal in a fire and you take it out and very quickly it becomes black, doesn't it? It goes cold. Put it back in and very quickly it becomes red again. Glowing, hot. So often as Christians, we, we believe the lie that we can self-sustain. We need to let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. To grow in our understanding of who Jesus is and who we are in him. To continually be reminded because you forget. Your brains are subject to decay. They forget. Your muscle memory of your flesh kicks in. You forget. Remember who you are 
by letting the message of Christ dwell among you richly. And then, in this section, three times it says, be thankful. Pick it up as I read it. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Brownie touched on this last night, didn't he? The Christian heart is a grateful heart. The Christian heart is a thankful heart. I wonder when the last time you spontaneously burst into song for Jesus was. Some of you going, what? That's a little bit odd. You know, you have those moments where you're just driving along in the car and you just see something and you just start to sing for him. It's a pretty horrendous noise in my car. I'm not the best of singers. But I love it. I love just to sing and thank him. Do it with the children all the time and my wife. Just suddenly, let's just go for it. Let's just sing a song. I normally get my daughter to style it off because she can sing and I can't. But continually give thanks to God. Be thankful. Be thankful. Be careful what language you speak. You see up here in the, the section of taking off our, our old clothes, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language on your lips. You see the contrast between that and being thankful. You see it's just totally and utterly different. You can speak a, a language of complaint or a language of praise. And when you walk into that changing room, are you going to be a person that speaks a language of complaint or a language of praise? Are you going to look for the positives in the performance and in people around you? Or ones of criticism and complaint about the situation you find yourself in? The choice is yours. Speak a language of praise. And praise to God our Father, our Creator, the one who has done everything for us. So there you have it. Chapter 3. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. You're raised with Christ. You're hidden with him. You will appear with him. Set your minds then and your heart on things above. Your passions and your focus of your mind on things above. Daily, regularly, moment by moment. Put things in place that will help you do that. Take off the old kit. Don't stroll around and hint in the hedges kit when you play for England. Take off the old kit. Be ruthless. It stinks. Don't pretend it doesn't. Don't do that classic thing when you know you smell, just cover yourself in deodorant. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Take off those old clothes. Put on the new kit of Christ. Live for him. Live like him. How? Gospel yourself. Tell your heart the gospel on a daily basis. Remind yourself of what he's done for you and who he is. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. Study the word. Get into Bible studies. Go to your groups. Be part of your church family. Put it first, not as an option extra if you can make it and there's nothing else better to do. Get there. And choose which language you speak. Today, tomorrow, and the rest of your life. Not one of complaint, but one of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. Imagine a hundred odd of you doing that, living like that. Imagine how much it would shake up your culture, your universities. Sure, it may get some derision, sure, it may get some persecution, but boy, would it make a difference, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be obvious as you walked in the room that you're a Christian, but by the time you walked out, everybody would see it, even if you didn't tell them. They'd see it by the way that you shine for him. That's my dream for myself. That's my dream for you. That we will be a generation that shines so brightly because we remember who we are that the world will see Jesus for who he really is. I read a great line from a, a, a theologian. The, um, he was asked a question at a lecture and it said... Um, <laughs> They said, well, what do you want your legacy to be? They said, legacy? They said, yeah, what do you want your legacy to be? When you die, when they write about you, 
what do you want to, them to write? And he said, oh, three very simple things. He became the gospel, he died, he was forgotten. I looked and I thought, that's a bit weird, isn't it? And he said, well, and he's asked to explain, he said, well, I'm not important, Jesus is. So I don't need people to remember me, I want them to remember him. And so therefore, I want to give my life to speak about him. Because I am his and he is mine. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are magnificent. You love us so deeply. Though we are so often so wretched, yet you love us so much. Thank you for the challenge of Colossians to see Jesus for who he really is. To remember that we're rooted and established in him and not be deceived by the culture around us. To remember who we are and to take off our old clothes and put on our new. And then to stand out in the world around us by praying, by playing, by saying together for your glory and not ours. Lord, as we head out from here, we ask that you would go with us, that your power would motivate us and help us, that the peace of Christ, the message of Christ, would rule in our hearts today, tomorrow, and until you come. In Jesus' name, amen.